I try to keep a little bit different. So let me share. Here we go. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to Libraries in Response. This is session 109 in this series that began, as you may recall, in 2020 in response to the uh, de declaration of the pandemic. Uh, our, our guest is Reed Hunt, uh, former FCC chair and currently the CEO of GB. GBCG, something like that. Like that. The, coalition, the Coalition for Green Capital. Exactly, which is a fascinating story, as well as all the other stories that Reed has from all the work that he's done over the years, and we will get to that. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, founded in 2007. Uh, our our co-producer of the series and host for the sessions is the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions, based in The Hague, and a longtime partner in community connectivity. Our series sponsor is the Federal Agency for Libraries in the U.S., IMLS, and we thank them so much this year. Uh, we're going to kind of go back through uh, this 30 years looking at these major inflection points, if we can use that, uh, the arrival of the, the World Wide Web, not the internet, which had been around, but the impact of the internet in, the, in, its, in its graphical uh, hyperlinked form of the web in the mid nineties. Uh, and of course the policy issues around all of these, poly re responses to all of these crises and opportunities. And then of course the financial collapse of 2008 and then the COVID pandemic uh, now nearly five years ago. And yes, the coalition for green capital. So that's going to be sort of our roadmap for today. Uh, and then this uh, wonderful quote from Reed, which uh, his work has really personified. And so these, this is not just rhetoric, but this is actually what Reed has been able to do. And we'll hear about that in terms of his, well, his actions and activities. Um, just mentioned that. So for our own role across this time frame or most of it uh not going back to the 90s we've been involved in community networking since the 80s but uh gln founded in 2007 with the idea that uh, we should connect all 17,000 libraries in the united states with fiber next generation broadband and it would be the most expedient economical and and equitable way to deliver next generation broadband into every community. Every community be defined by a geographical area around a library. Uh, we still think that's true and we're still working on that. A lot of progress has been made. Uh, uh, six years later, we picked up wireless, which was something that was starting to really, really take off. So it had, you know, from the uh, advent of the iPhone, but uh, the, there were new new wireless technologies coming along, which uh, allowed libraries with strong backhaul, fiber backhaul, to extend access, access that tens of millions of people used. Roughly, uh, roughly a third of all adults accessed the internet at a library, at a public library. Most of them had some other source, but they used it, you know, because it was convenient or faster or quiet or whatever. Some of them totally depended on libraries for access. And so our uh, approach was to use this wireless to extend that service, effectively library Wi-Fi, uh, using these wireless technologies as a dual use, both to expand access and to increase resilience. This, is, uh, this has been a thread through, well, everything we've done since then is to focus on the occasional but severe moments when connectivity is really, really needed. Uh, we started with TV white space, which is really an interesting story, a difficult one. CBRS, which has done amazingly well. Educational broad uh, broadband services, uh, which is uh, a fascinating spectrum era. Uh, 
traditional Wi-Fi frequencies, even for longer range, and then finally for low Earth orbit satellites, just one thing after another to explore these as emerging technologies. And we funded projects in all of these, all of these, uh, all these areas and applications. Uh, libraries in response, as I mentioned earlier, we, we initiated in response to the pandemic uh, to respond to the question like, well, okay, what is a library if the building is closed? It's not nothing, but what? And so that led to one thing after another, basically a, a cascade of, uh, of uh, crises. There was the COVID crisis. There was the, the social crisis after the Floyd murder. There was the economic crisis. There was the political crisis. There's the ever pervasive climate crisis. And now we have AI as a new kind of a crisis. All of these impact libraries and their communities and the role of libraries in the ICT, information communication technology infrastructure. What is that role? It's changing as the technology changes and it's an ongoing reinvention. Uh, these main barriers is kind of how we organize around uh, projects to address that. Uh, if it's not available, this is kind of the starting point, if it's not available, it really doesn't matter how affordable it is. It just doesn't matter. And the same thing with its usability. So availability is, is critical. They're all really essential, but they all are, are, are uh, relevant. And so availability is uh, kind of what drew us to the LEO technology, which is fascinating that it, you can connect anywhere on the planet with this robust technology. This is a, a cartoon that we have just really been attracted to. This kind of uh, term uh, polycrisis is, has been thrown around a lot lately. And this is, a, this is a kind of illustration of the poor world longing for the good old days of merely nuclear annihilation is the only threat. Now we have uh, all of these things at us. Our, our vision, if you will, is a, is a world that is enclosed or surrounded or backed up by a, a global network of libraries, public libraries, because they serve everybody, but also school and academic libraries, because they all do so much, but support uh, uh, to, to deal and cope with these challenges and crises. Of course, COVID is with us. I'm, I had it myself just in August and it was rough. It's not gone away. It's not going away. It's just going to keep morphing. And, um, and then the climate is really what's in the news and what's always on our mind. And it's the big kahuna of crisis. It really shrinks all the other crises, uh, I, I have to say, which is a, can be a painful thing for a lot of people that suffered from individual problems that we've had. Uh, this is our happy collage of uh, the uh, types of devastations that are happening around the world. And this was this was happening exactly a week ago today. Uh, that's where Helene was, and that was the chart. And it has done exactly that. And it's created just massive dislocations for people that thought they were, you know, more or less immune to hurricanes and those kind of problems. This is a... <laughs> This is a really fascinating chart of uh, the cost of these disasters. And you can see how they go up. I think the top there is around uh, 350, something like that. And then a few years later, it, it, they, they've stopped doing $20 billion uh, and go to full $50 billion metrics. Okay. And then yet again, uh, this is last year. And this year, I'm sure is going to blow that away. It's a disturbing trend, and <clears throat> there's not a lot that that individuals, individual communities, even individual institutions, local community institutions, can do about mitigation. I mean, yes, we all need to do our part, but you know, can we really bend the tide? It, it it's necessary, but it's just really hard for an individual to cope with that. What individuals, homes, people local institutions can do is adapt to the changes that are happening and will happen. I mean, it, there's no stopping this. Uh, we can slow it down and maybe we can reverse it, but there's no stopping it for the foreseeable. So we're going to have to adapt to it. That's part of why the uh, preparation uh, and, and redundant networks are, are so vital. 
uh, all these thousands and thousands of people in North Carolina now have no idea still where many of their relatives and friends are because the communication system is completely wiped out. Cell towers are all down and electricity is out. So having a plan like a battery and some kind of wireless capability at the ready is really a good idea. And if you can use it every every day to supplement your connectivity, so much the better. So here we are uh, to our, our speaker and our very special guest, uh, Reed Hunt. And uh, let me stop this shit here. So welcome, Reed. Uh, we have a small but actually very uh, influential group with us today. Uh, I see Brooks, he's the executive director of the Urban Libraries Council. Uh, and I mentioned Jen Nelson, the, the, the New Jersey state librarian, Stephen Abram, uh, a leading thinker in the library world and others that are returning and maybe some new ones, but welcome everyone. And welcome especially to Reed uh, so please read, uh, give us a, a, a kind of a, a little, if you would, a little personal background on, you know, how did you come to all this? Did you just sort of grow up thinking you were going to be a, uh, a, a, a telecommunications policy leader, or did it, it must've kind of a come to you at some point. So one thing usually leads to another, but start us out with that and, and then take us through the first phase of this three phase of, of what happened in the 90s. So welcome, Reed Hunt. Thank you very much. Uh, it was so interesting listening to you, Don. I'm, I'm sorry to, to take over the microphone because you could you could go on and you were saying many, many wise things. Uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, coincidence and serendipity uh, have defined uh, the, the course of my life in many, many ways. Here's the uh, principal example that relates to your topic. Uh, in ninth grade, uh, I went to a new high school and I made a friend out of Al Gore. And uh, as time marched on and he was in the Congress and then was running for the Senate, uh, I spent more and more uh, uh, days and hours uh, listening to him. And the two of the three main things that he was doing as a politician were uh, uh, speaking about and thinking about the war against <clears throat> climate uh, catastrophe and the war for the dissemination of information on a global basis. The third thing was that he was uh, uh, developing various strategies to um, to de-escalate the Cold War. These three themes uh, defined his early career in Congress and in the Senate, and I was privileged to be uh, in the room with him uh, very, very often in those years. Then in the summer of 1992, he asked me to join him at the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, while we were down there, uh, uh, he said, let's start making a movie and it'll be a movie about uh, climate change. So we went down to the Atlantic rainforest, which is south of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, we did some filming uh, of Al Gore discussing uh, the um, effects of climate change. And while we were doing that, we got a phone call from a friend of mine from law school. Coincidence number two, a fellow named Bill Clinton. And Bill said, uh, Al, we've never met, but would you fly back to the Washington, uh, Washington to, to, to the United States uh, from wherever you are uh, so that I can interview you with the prospect of possibly naming you as the vice president? That was the end of the filming. Wow. We, took the, uh, we took the film, which in those days was actually a, a tangible object, not digitized. We put it in a refrigerator uh, in, in Washington, D.C. The interview was held on the tarmac uh, of an airport outside of Philadelphia. Al uh, was picked as the vice president, and I ended up uh, later that year in Little Rock uh, uh, in a room 
with a friend named Carol Browner. And I said, the two things that Al, our, our, our boss here, or the, the, the vice president, uh, the two things that he's going to have the most say over are communications and the environment. She said, well, I'd like to be the head of the Environment Protection Agency. And I said, okay, well, that leaves the Federal Communications Commission for me. Uh, I'm not making any of this up. Uh, so uh, the chief of staff to the vice president, Roy Neal, was playing golf with President-elect Clinton. That's the way that they had their one-on-one -on -one meeting to discuss who would get what job. And uh, that's that was the... That was the interview, so to speak, meaning Roy uh, talked to Bill about it, and Bill said, fine with me. And there were a lot of other twists and turns, but I ended up at the FCC. Carol ended up at the EPA. And then um, 16 years later, I'm on the Obama transition team, and I said to myself, well, I'm back on another transition team. Why don't I uh, switch to the other electromagnetic wave platform and and you know offer my views for whatever they're worth about electricity uh, to to add to the previous 16 years of commentary on, uh, on on information and communication. So that's my personal story. A bunch of coincidences. Uh, but they've all all the coincidences have been about the two platforms that underlie the uh, uh, notion of society and the economy uh, in, everywhere in the world, and that is the electromagnetic uh, wave platform that gives us electricity, and the electromagnetic wave platform that transfers and stores information, and they are both just different frequencies of electromagnetic waves. And um, in many countries, if you look up at a telephone pole, you'll see that the wires for both frequencies are hanging on that pole. And the networks that um, um, sus physically sustain these, uh, these, these two different uh, sets of frequencies are uh, um, coterminous in most places. Uh, Many, many economic similarities, uh, many uh, economic uh, challenges and physical challenges that are alike between the two platforms. But the fundamental idea uh, that you can either be in favor of or you can be against is, do we want electricity and information to be universally available at the lowest conceivable cost so that absolutely everybody on the planet can learn anything they want and can keep the lights on at night. You either agree or disagree with it. If you're in China, uh, as I have been talking to the uh, chief uh, of internet censorship, the answer to that question is no, we don't want that. We want to have the government limit the access to information. Uh, and if you then walk across the hall, so to speak, and and talk to the uh, people running the energy sector in China, they'll say, we use the energy sector as part of the state-driven industrial policies. And they that requires that we, uh, right now, uh, burn more coal and contribute more in emissions than any other uh, country in the world. So the answer to these two questions is not necessarily the same in every country. But the answer in the United States, not all the time, but most of the time in my lifetime has been, yeah, we do want that. We want clean and cheap and universally available electricity. And we want uh, uh, safe and cheap and universally available information. So if you if you as as I have uh, agreed strongly with these two views. And if you're lucky enough because of these coincidences to have some access to the levers of power in government, you know what to do, you know what to do. And so in summary, um, I've been involved in causing about $110 billion of public capital to be spent in connecting uh, information, let's call it, to uh, classrooms and libraries, about $10 billion to libraries. 
and I've been involved in uh, so far uh, about $27 billion of capital to be dedicated to green banks. So um, the, pe people say, I've done these things. You only really mean, you only say it that way when you're running for president. I did this, I did that. <laughs> the, the I here is an is me with, with not just dozens, but hundreds and even thousands of um, colleagues and and uh, fellow uh, members of these causes. Um, the Urban Libraries Council was a client of mine at one point. Uh, you mentioned you will see earlier. Uh, but, you know, I'm really uh, happy to be able to give you this capsule summary of, of these activities because we've been pretty successful and I'm saving uh, uh, for my memoirs, you know, a, a book entitled my million mistakes. I'm not going to uh, give you any hints about that right now. Uh, and the one thing I would like to say is that the the cause of clean, cheap, safe electricity and 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 cheap, universally available information. Those two causes are uh, always always um, in a battle uh, against uh, many different enemies. They're in a battle against uh, people who stand for the status quo. They're in a battle against people who think that uh, that human beings should not be trusted to have access to information because they won't use it uh, correctly, or they won't, or they'll be uh, informed of things that 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 others don't want them to be informed of. I consider this overall to be a battle for. And to put a too fine a point on it, for a for a better uh, definition of society and of, of of humanity, as opposed to a worse one. But you don't have to you don't have to um, agree with that because the nature of universally available and affordable information is that it should permit disagreement. Uh, but you do you do have to recognize that there are competing schools of thought, and I gave you a glimpse of the view in China. Uh, uh, there are other countries, you know, where the view is even more draconian, North Korea, you know, many others, uh, where the very idea of universally available information is a threat to the power structure. When way back in, um, the early nineties, um, this is the way that we, this is my, the first book I ever wrote. You say you want a revolution. This is the story of how we formed these views. We meaning the vice president and president and the different people in the Clinton administration. And then um, this book, which was the second book I wrote in China's Shadow, was about the contest over these topics between China and the United States. And this book, see, these are actual tangible physical objects, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, this book is, is basically the approach I'm talking about. Abundance. Abundance. Abundance is a word that includes, it's universally available and it's really really cheap uh, both the electricity and the and, and then the in, and then the information so on a going forward basis it's just a continuing uh, struggle for this point of view versus the its enemies and uh, there's okay. always an open door to all the advocates who want to join at least on our side okay okay well i i, I have a question right away here uh and and we'll open it up. I think if we can kind of go through these segments one at a time and then do a little interactivity, we might, uh, well, who knows where we might, but uh, your point is well made about uh, the, the goal of universal service, the universal service fund, uh, and, and universal service itself is a concept that says if there's a basic service like water and electricity and uh, and and, and communications that it should be uh, affordable and available to everyone, you know, roads, uh, it's, it's infrastructure. And this electromagnetic pairing that you mentioned is, is really a new infrastructure. Uh, and the one that's kind of embedded in all the other previous infrastructures is kind of, kind of a meta infrastructure, you know, the ring that binds them. So, what could be more important than that to civilization and its operation? And yet, uh, infrastructure economics says that 
the farther you are away from the core of any network, gas, whatever, the more expensive it is to deliver the services. Not only that, there are fewer people out there to deliver services to, and they tend to have less money. So invariably, the wires and the towers stop. And that's what we've seen. It seems like the 90s, when the web arrived, that the uh, traditional utilities, regulated utilities who were being, you know, coerced into providing universal services, telephone, uh, said, no, we're not, we're not that. We're just technology companies. We're like Cisco and Intel, and we'll just make decisions on where to invest for our expected return. And so they just stopped. And so the rural parts of the country, the, the, the less developed urban areas just have continued to struggle for services. So how did that, how did that happen? How did they get relief from universal service obligations? And the, so we've been, we can't, they weren't, being coerced after that, but they've been trying to be sort of, you know, given enough money to do it anyway, which they're very good at taking and still not really delivering on it. So what happened there, Reed? Well, let me take your very thoughtful remark and, uh, and you know, grossly oversimplify it. Uh, is distance from a uh, population concentration uh, uh, necessarily an increase in the cost of delivery. If you're far away from a uh, metro area, is it necessarily uh, therefore the case that delivering either information or electricity is more costly? You know, the answer is it could be true. And then, uh, and then technology uh, with a little uh, help from public capital or also called government we'll find a way to lower the cost. So this is the cost lowering device, uh, uh, pretty much universally available around 60% of the uh, population of the entire planet now has a subscription, you know, to, to something like this smartphone. And uh, this will operate um, in the geographic location of about 95% of all the uh, human population. This is the first time in human history that information is that widely available. In terms of electricity, uh, the uh, solution is the uh, solar panel on the roof or the, uh, or the windmill, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, cornfield, you know, next door, meaning these are distributed ways of generating uh, uh, power. Uh, the, the biggest example, the one that is now taken for granted, is the introduction of the personal computer, which literally meant instead of a centralized mainframe being the device that would store and calculate and pr present information, we would have the personal computer by definition, as distributed as as you would find people. So what I'm saying here is that with a little uh, help from government, the uh, uh, cost of distance can be reduced to near zero. And this is true for both uh, electromagnetic wave platforms. You do need a little help. Um, pending in the Congress in the United States right now is a a broadband um, distribution um, bill, which uh, in its current dysfunctional form, Congress hasn't passed. But right after this election, I think it'll take another crack at that and pass that. That's that's the completion of a network of broadband connections to all of uh, uh, all neighborhoods in the country. Right. So there's no reason technologically or economically to um, feel that we cannot uh, uh, achieve true universality for both electricity and for information. The issue is the same issue that I mentioned before, which is there are enemies of that goal. There are people that want the information. They want the books taken out of the libraries, both both in real and in digital uh, own form. And they want the status quo in terms of energy, the burning of coal and oil and gas to continue. Uh, th those are those are enemies. Th th they are against the vision that I've outlined here. I don't mean to say that 
I don't want to pass moral judgment. I'm just saying the reality is we're for this, they're for something else. Well, well, a point point taken that the the decentralization of technology has been phenomenal. And the delivery, this is what attracted us to low Earth orbit satellites, is that suddenly you had a technology, right. an infrastructure, a global communication infrastructure, semi-autonomous, semi-autonomous that could touch anywhere on the planet. Like that, just instantly, plug and play technology. So we'll see how that plays out. There's a lot of a lot of challenges to it and problems. We we've talked about it quite a bit uh, before. Uh, anyone want to uh, have a question or a comment related to the the the, the mid '90s to the mid 2000s and the circumstances in, uh, or we can. Just jump right in. Everybody can unmute and say anything they want, uh, knowing that, of course, being recorded. All right, let's let's move to the response of the uh, of the of the financial crisis. That was a pretty rough road. So, how did that how did that trigger? I mean, we know there was a a pretty significant response uh, from the government in the US and around the world. But what did that do to this this ICT infrastructure that we're talking about? How did it how did it really change that and uh, the ICT energy, I guess we would call it? Well, uh what are we doing right now? We're looking at each other on computer screens. Right. Uh, prior prior to the uh financial crisis and after the financial crisis, it was actually frequently said that nobody wanted to do that. Uh, and although the technology was available, nobody wanted to do it. And uh, so there was a pivotal moment uh, where all of a sudden everybody wanted to do that. That was COVID. Hmm. So COVID triggered a complete change in the way that we communicate because we had to be isolated. And so we then in many, many countries and certainly in the United States, we then said, well, if we're going to have to stay in our dwellings, wherever they may be, and we do actually want to look at documents together or look at pictures together or look at each other together, you know, what technologies do we have? And all of a sudden, a company called Zoom went from worth almost nothing to worth a staggering amount. What the financial crisis did in 2008 and nine uh, was that it raised a different issue, and that is suppose that the entire global, or at least Western financial system uh, is paralyzed. What do we do then? Do, what do we change to, right? And the story of the response there is that old thinking concerns about um, the uh, limits of, of appropriate uh, government spending Concern of that kind of old thinking or pre existing thinking constrained and limited the government response in the United States and in Europe. It was so constrained in Europe, in particular, that the very fabric of the EU uh, was uh, uh, threatened. Nevertheless, Oh, some steps were taken, particularly to restore the existing um, major uh, pillars of the financial system in the United States, the big money center banks. And consequently, over a long period of time, from 2009 uh, on to 2016, uh, the the economy recovered. But the but the lesson uh, of of that time period wasn't actually learned in the United States until President Biden took office. So when President Biden took office in the beginning of 2021, he and his whole team looked back at what was done in 2009 and they said, we're going to do, we're going to now restore the economy differently. The situation wasn't a financial crisis, it was a COVID crisis. So, so while uh, COVID caused the explosion of Zoom and Zooming and other forms of interaction like we're using today, it also uh, called for a government response in terms of the economy. The 
the unemployment uh, caused by COVID was far greater even than the staggering unemployment that was caused by the financial crisis. So the, what I'm, the linkage I'm making is that the financial crisis was round one, the COVID was round two, and they both called for government responses. In round two, after COVID, the United States government adopted uh, the uh, through the bitter learning experience of the long drawn out recovery 2009 to 2016, it adopted the a superior response, and that is spend whatever it takes to get the economy to come back. So that that attitude, sometimes called uh, with the Biden mantra of build back better, uh, first labeled as the American Relief Act, ultimately translated into two pieces of legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. You add that all together, and what does it consist of? A public support for broadband, uh, tremendous uh, public support for the clean power platform, public support for manufacturing, public support for child care tax credits, a host of different uh, remedies to distinct problems with the aggregate impact being let's have the fastest economic recovery from catastrophe that any major country has ever seen. That's what happened. That's the Biden administration story. Now, back to the, uh, briefly, back to the contest between truth and falsehood. In the same time period, for a variety of technological and cultural reasons, the battle between truth and falsehood becomes a pitched war. And um, probably now, the majority of Americans believe something that is untrue, and close to half believe a host of things that are untrue. So we are now in a, a battle between truth and falsehood that I think is an inevitable uh, outcome of the universal access uh, to information. Meaning, I don't think it's bad that we're in that battle. I think it's a necessary phase of this development to universal access to information. We do need to have it be that the United States and every other culture comes out on the right side of this. I mean, the truth needs to prevail uh, because um, it's in the uh, sleep of reason that uh, nightmares uh, dwell. Fascinating. Um, you make, you make a, a seriously powerful point here about uh, major uh, crisis response where the market is just not built for that. Government is built for that. And people turn to government to respond to these huge challenges that come. And your uh, point about the kinds of investments that were made takes me back to uh, the 90s and China and your comments about their, their investments there. And we've seen a lot happen there. And this is kind of, in the unintended consequences category here, which we had a question about, a technical question I'll get to in a second. <clears throat> uh, in the 90s, I'd, I started a, a software venture in, in China. We ran that, it's still running, but I was involved for about 10 years. This was the explosion of the internet. Uh, the web had arrived. They were, they were just excited out of their minds in China. This was like a blank slate. They could come in and build this most facile communication technology that would support you know, uh, economic development, social development. And uh, and so many people in the U.S., this is a great opportunity that, that China will uh, use this technology, but they won't be able to use it for economic advantage with and control it at the same time. It's the same thing. So they can't really split the baby is what we all believe, that one thing would lead to another. And they were saying, yes, we want to become a democratic uh, nation, just give us time. We're developing country. Just give us more time. Uh, that story changed once they proved that they actually could divide the baby with tens of thousands of uh, monitors on the on the internet to keep it closed and tight uh, behind the great firewall. <laughs> and and then from as a result of dysfunction of of our government from two thousand eight. 
uh, uh, generally speaking, and the, the the high contention that sort of evolved. Uh, and and that time they said they started saying, well, why would anybody want that? You know, that's out of control. They their response in two thousand eight was massive investment in infrastructure. I mean, massive, and it boomed their economy. I mean, it boomed from the nineties. It boomed again, but then they overbuilt. They built you know, roads to nowhere. They built cities with no people, but they just kept doing it. And they started exporting infrastructure to others all around the world. So they have taken a, a they've intervened, but it looks like they're, they've created problems that they, that they didn't have. It's, it's a huge challenge. Uh, but uh, to this uh, point, we've got a question from, uh, 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 from uh, the, from Miguel about, the unintended consequences of section 230 which is kind of oh, right a very specific uh, point from this macro uh topic uh so see, uh, do yeah. i see the question or what is the question it's uh i'm curious has uh any second any unintended, second consequences, about the unintended of, consequences 230 yeah uh, which was so important to help jump start the internet revolution right uh, Section 230, um, and Miguel is obviously a real cognoscente here, but Section 230 is a provision of um, of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 uh, that uh, protected from lawsuits of uh, the companies that would, um, just to put it in colloquial language, that you know that would post information you know on the internet. So. Uh, at the time that it was passed, way back in 1996, you know there wasn't a there wasn't a Facebook, uh, and uh, and there wasn't the Google that we know today. Uh, but uh, the concept at that time was, if if you type something on the internet, uh, whoever is your host, who's ever creating the screen, is not liable for whatever you said, not legally liable. And so the idea was that the internet was like a, uh, like 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 uh, like a subway car, <laughs> and if somebody uh, spray painted something bad on the walls, you couldn't hold the subway car owner legally responsible. That was that was the that was the core idea of Section Two Thirty. Uh, the the consequence was that. When in the succeeding years, uh, companies were created around the idea of monetizing all of that content. A Facebook takes all of those postings, organizes them, presents them, creates a community of posters, advertises uh, in, in adjacently along with all of these comments, becomes worth billions and billions of dollars because it has uh, garnered attention and advertisers pay for the attention. So now we don't have the uh, subway car or the, or the concrete wall that somebody's spray painting on. We actually have companies that are, that are in many, many sophisticated ways organizing all this commentary. Then the, then the next step is that these companies have, in some cases, the incentive, the economic incentive, in some cases, uh, the ideological incentive to use all of that posting to communicate a message of their own. So you get someone like Elon Musk who buys Twitter in, or among other reasons to be able to impose his views into uh, on others and communicate them you know, into what I would call, you know, the sea of irrationality. Uh, so, so the use of the internet has changed in ways that Section 230 did not contemplate. Well, that's not shocking. The uh, Electoral College created in the 1700s is now the basis of a completely anti-democratic method of electing the President of the United States meaning about 150,000 swing voters will decide who the president is. That's not democracy. That is a very, very uh, uh, skewed and crazy form of democracy. It is much better than no democracy at all, but it's not a very, it's not a very good substitute for, for a, a national plebiscite. 
So in other words, things happen. You have a certain concept, technology changes, you need to revise the concept. Section 230 needs to be rewritten or even junked because the way it is uh, used now is to protect the companies that monetize and militarize information uh, from liability, and I don't think they should be protected. Very good. And, and it touches on a, a wider problem of technology, of these unintended consequences. How do, you, how do you regulate something that you can barely define? I mean, a new phenomenon comes up that technology enables. You're, you know, you're struggling for metaphors with subways. Uh, we're trying to use terms from old media to describe new media that don't quite fit. Is it, is it like a telephone? Is it like a newspaper? Is it you know, something else? Uh, so we're always kind of chasing the, the, the technology. We're always trying to define it. And you have to define it first before you can regulate it. You have to say what it is before you can write that into uh, into rec. So it's a it's a, a fascinating problem uh, for technology in general to to kind of keep up with it. And it seems that these companies are just racing ahead of legal restraints, and the political system allows very large players to have an outsized influence on public policy. Um, well, it doesn't well, it's not well, just big tech, of course. This is the way I think of it, you know, in a, in, you know, keeping it kind of absurdly short and, and simple. You know, what is regulation? It is just the translation of law into some details. So let's just say, you know, what, what are we talking about here in terms of law? Law is an expression of, of rights and privileges. It is a guarantee of rights and privileges. It is a, a way to have a, a safe and healthy society where people can enjoy their rights and have certain privileges. Uh, it is it is not the enemy of the people. It is meant to be the manifestation of a framework or a system in which people can uh, make make their own personal choices and 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 express themselves and fulfill themselves as they want. That's a fundamentally liberal, not meaning democratic or republican, just a fundamentally liberal way of describing what the purpose is. When in 1993 and four at the FCC, sitting in Al Gore's office, we talked about everything that was going to happen. We did, in fact, have a fundamental framework in mind. And it included, and but was not limited to, uh, uh, universal access to information. We already talked about that. And we looked at the technologies and talked to the people that were the technologists and we heard the way they described the future, and we decided to embrace it, not fight it. What was it? Mobile and internet. Internet and mobile. So we decided to, to have it be that the new paradigm, universally available information in digital form, communicated both on wire and wirelessly, that was the thing to embrace. I've had a whole bunch of postings on LinkedIn of an essay about how we applied that quite specifically in the markets for uh, digital cellular. Uh, things, in fact, worked out the way we wanted. Uh, incredibly rapid 10x change in subscriptions to both the internet and into digital cellular. I just said to Miguel, 230 did not work out the way that we wanted. But now, and I see that um, there's a question about AI. Let's get to that. Yeah, yeah it raises it raises Let's... raises the the same kind of issue, right? Yeah. We can we we can we can be the most savvy, thoughtful, understanding, brilliant uh, discussants of AI, and we're not going to know whether it is a force for good or a force for evil. We're not going to know that right now. What we what we can know is that it is very very powerful and therefore ought to be harnessed to a vision of uh, human rights that um, should be enduring. That's something we can know, right? And in my view, uh, what the, uh, the job of the next Congress, hopefully under uh, President Harris, will be to do exactly that. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I think that's the job. 
I also think the world needs an AI treaty because any country can take it in any direction. And as is the case with nuclear weapons, uh, some of the directions are unimaginably horrible. So I think we are going to need a global AI treaty and we're going to need a fundamental paradigm. And, it, and I don't mean that it is for or against AI. I mean that it links the power of artificial intelligence to a enduring vision of the way people ought to be able to be free. Very good. Uh, I couldn't agree more on that. The, the, it is a global phenomena. We're not good at global policy, but yet we have to. I mean, COVID sort of taught us that. At least we thought it would teach us that. But I, I think I, I don't mean I don't mean to be disagreeable. I think we're really good at some global policies. You know, we All have right. global awareness of climate change. We had we had a global treaty. I I was one of the negotiators. We had a global treaty reached in 1997 to have the internet go into 69 countries that accounted for. The majority of human of of of, of the of, of of the global population, nope. you know, we had the global spread of digital cellular, the global spread of internet access. You know, we we do we to have it be that billions and billions of people are collectively part of these phenomena is amazing, is amazing. It yep. it dwarfs it dwarfs the Pax Romana, you know, of of two thousand years ago. It's it's. It's simply staggering. Now, do we have collective global action on everything that needs action? No. And AI is still a new challenge, for sure. So let's let's jump into this a little bit uh, with our remaining time. This is the kind of the current phase that, that we're facing. Uh, uh, COVID put so many more people online than ever been before, emphasized the importance of that infrastructure. It's kind of passed or reduced, but it, we haven't gone back. We're, we're not going back, probably. A lot of these things have permanent changes. People will actually like working from home and the rest of it. AI enters the scene. I say AI, I mean this kind of consumer level, uh, end user level of a, of a tool that is serious. I mean, it's a major technology. It may be a general purpose technology, and possibly a, a threat like nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons lack the potential for autonomy that AI seems to possess, which is another level of consideration for what this all means. One of the ideas has come up uh, since all the AI services that are being put forward out there are by commercial interests, you know, the, not that many really that have the, the wherewithal. Uh, an idea has come up for a public AI option, a public infrastructure AI, which is a fascinating thing. We're exploring that. Uh, we just wondered, and, and uh, Jen Nelson has a question from New Jersey, what you thought about that, that idea of public AI, kind of a public option, if you will, for artificial intelligence. So what's the really, really uh, big economic concern with AI? And the answer is so far, it appears that in order to be the proprietor of the delivery of AI services, it is necessary to amass many, many, many billions of dollars so far. Unlike the personal computer, it doesn't appear that you can have a fairly low price point for controlling your own expression of information and and in using computing so far so far it appears that you have to have 10 to 100 billion dollars in a multi-billion dollar annual spending to perform the uh, computation over vast arrays of data that is actually the necessity to create the AI output. So we have a risk now that the tendency of any AI market is toward oligopoly and towards the control of the many by the few. This is a risk that needs to be dealt with in legislation. A uh, big debate about whether Governor Newsom, one of the questions asked about this, uh, Steve asked about this, I think, yeah. Uh, 
the big debate about whether Governor Newsom in California should have vetoed the recent bill or should not have vetoed the recent bill. I think he did the right thing because I think the bill that he got from the legislature uh, is too biased in favor of the uh, potential oligopolists and against uh, openness. But it's really clear that uh, that's a governor who knows what he's talking about and is looking in the next legislation for something resembling open access. When we talk about a public option in healthcare, when we talk about open access on the internet, when we talk about net neutrality, we're all talking about something that is at, at a general level the same thing. And that is, you know, can those without money get access to the services? That's what we're talking about, right? Uh, and and so the idea that there is a government AI system is, in my mind, a very, very, very good one. Not because the government should control it, but because that would be an appropriate check against oligopoly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, one area of expenditure that might be applicable to this is uh, is how much is being spent on e-government. The vast amounts that could be restructured to provide public services uh, in a different way. But uh, we, we're running uh, towards the end here. And I two things. One, I'd like to get your fresh notion about the role of libraries in this this ICT infrastructure. And also we want to hear about the Green Bank. Well, I mean, what is the what's the economic underpinnings of that of that venture? It's really fascinating. So those two things I think we can maybe maybe run over a few minutes if you if you have the time. But I think it'd like, we'd like to hear. You know, I do have to leave it exactly uh, 12, so you're going to get the short version of me, and I and I appreciate you allowing me to use the time of this group, you know, in the previous 58 minutes. Uh, my nephew is in the Brooklyn uh, uh, Library. My uh, sister uh, was the head of the Rockville, Maryland Library and in the Montgomery County system for many years. Uh, I've learned a lot about libraries from them. Um Everybody here, I'm sure, knows what I'm going to tell you, and that is any particular library and any particular person is a multi-service public facility. Maybe teaching English as a second language, hosting art classes, no longer a place where only where people can borrow books because they can't afford to get it some other way or find it to be more convenient to borrow it and return it. No longer that. But a but a multi-service dispenser of a large number of, of of benefits to a community. This is great. This is totally this is totally wonderful. Consequently, give libraries more funds, let them let them have still more services. You know, put the sociologists in these libraries and put the uh, uh, people that can give healthcare advice in these libraries. And, and have the MLS degree include, uh, you know, training and learning and all these other facilities, the way my nephew's MLS has actually made him a computer geek. Sure. This is totally the way to go. And everybody here that is in libraries, I hope, is agreeing with me violently. We, you need more, not less, in order to do more things. Because in the real world, you have to be talking to people. And people do live not entirely in the virtual world. And in the real world, they often need they need a conversation. They need a facility. They need a place. So let's let's keep providing the capabilities and functionalities for these libraries. And let's have it be that they are meeting places for human beings and therefore a place where we nurture a healthy society. And on that note, Don, I really need to say goodbye. Fantastic. Thank you, Reed. We're going to come back and, and talk about the Green Bank, okay? We're going to have another session. Some other we'll time. Back. Thank you. Bye. 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 We refer Bye. to the libraries as the Swiss Army knife of public institutions. Doing more more things for more people. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Thank you, Don. Well... No, that's not right.
Well, we'll just chop it off. Uh, sorry, you, you know, it was so much ground to cover there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we're, we're finished. What an amazing uh, track this fellow has had. Uh, and um, public events. Yeah. Wow. The last point, Jen. I didn't. I didn't feel like he he believed there was uh, funding that could make public AI a reality. Yeah, you know, I keep going back to my thought that you know people are from my perspective, which is admittedly naive. Um, people consider AI as a monolith, and it's really not. It's a series of of other kinds of lifts, if you will. And I think there's a way to scale. I don't know what it is, but I think there's a way to scale out there that could make it affordable. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Don't know what it, I don't know what it is. But taking his point about decentralization being sort of the democratizing uh, phenomena of technology. Now we all have a phone and we all have solar panels, you know, it doesn't require mainframe approach to everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's an AI version of decentralization. Mm -hmm. you know, people oh, I, 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 an autonomous front end. I mean, Apple, is there, are they trying to do that? Apple trying to give you a little AI on your phone? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, they are. So, yeah. And I think, uh, I think one of the things that I, my insight from listening to Reed was there were people back in the day in government like Reed and Al Gore who could see the potential of what could happen with the internet. And it happened. Now it's time for a new vision and somebody to come along who sees the potential in what this next step is going to be. So instead of a retrieval-oriented, connectivity, networking-oriented internet, we're moving to a thinking internet. Now that calculus and the ability to do cognitive uh, conversations in the internet is already launched, that's a fundamental shift. And that fundamental shift needs to take our nose off the window screen and last mile stuff which is absolutely still important. But now it's looking at uh, what do we do with the folks now? What skills do they need on cognitive behaviors? Like we've taught people how to retrieve and how to research, search and search again. We haven't taught them how to ask questions as well as we need to and how to respond to answers and now the, uh, the latest meta tool and the open AI tool are self-correcting their answers in progress. That's very fascinating. And that requires a different skill base in the advanced economies and beyond, because any other economy could leap over us uh, to, to learn that stuff. So I think that's a role for libraries big time. That's a great one. That's a great one, Stephen. Uh, the, the skill question, what, what are these skills? It used to be a primary skill to succeed was acquiring information, knowledge, having information at your fingertips. I, you know, I'm, I read all these books. I, I know all this field of medicine or engineering or whatever. You know, I, now I can apply it. Of course, experience is relevant to that. But behind it, you know, there's all this acquired knowledge that now is more or less or will be yeah. soon at everybody's fingertips. You know, I don't. I don't have you to need... know who starred in some movie or who led what revolution. I can just ask. And... But also more, more, more advanced in the medical field. Yes, you have to know how to process and choose the information as a medical professional of all types. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to have it all in your head as memory. So right. the AI tools that are being put, put in drug uh, prescriptions and everything are informing you at a at at a plateau that's a whole staircase above where it was when you had to memorize things. Yeah, and I'm just trying to make the point that that skill of hold acquiring and holding all the information was a big differentiator. And yeah, so, to your not point, going now, to maybe you know asking the right questions or being more creative about 
uh, using the same things in new ways will be the the mm -hmm. skills of the future. But well, even you know, yeah. is basic literacy. You have to know how to read and interpret and understand before yeah. you begin gobs of information and be able to turn it back around and ask questions. So that basic literacy becomes that much more important. And, you know, they can have kids on devices and not reading. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think that, again, reinforces the more traditional notion of a library, but it's just as important. Um, and I, you're right, Stephen, that asking a question is, is just central. You know, if libraries could do nothing but teach people how to uh, put in appropriate prompts to AI, that would be huge. Right. And how to reframe your question, like all the research in our field about the reference interview. So you ask a question of AI, and then you say, oh, AI, I noticed this. I need you to reframe your answer for a patient who's overweight with diabetes. And so that you're constantly mm -hmm. uh, improving mm -hmm. good questions, improve the answers mm -hmm. instead of retrieving answers that you can't adjust as quickly or as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a really interesting thing. And people are not good at questions. Yeah. And yeah, uh, there was just a recent article story about uh, reading habits and uh, the complete collapse of book reading by young people. They just they just don't read them anymore. So the the universities are not assigning uh, books at the level that they were. They don't even have the reading level requirements that used to be not that long ago but some, just, some of that don is is false information there uh when you look into that data and look under the hood you find out they're reading a lot more but they're reading in a more modern way we've gone to an article and chapter level economy not a book economy and so uh -huh. kids are reading as many books as part of okay, the curriculum reading is but they have words. no spare time reading as many words but summaries it's not the same thing as reading a novel and being into a novel in a in a uh, in a way that the novel was created the stories are very different because you know now if you're reading a novel on your tablet the the messages are popping up i'll, I'll get back to that i'll respond to that that text message so it's this distraction capability of the of the handheld technology that has really made uh a difference so it's it's I, trouble I, in I, terms I, of I what kind of literacy that, people are going to have that are those three of us who i see pictures of on the screen uh grew up in a world where end-to-end -end reading and novels fiction was privileged over non-fiction and technical reports hmm. and short emails and and texts and stuff like that so i think that uh the variety of reading needs to be measured in terms of content, not number of words, mm -hmm. and in terms of uh, ready for use, quality for use, adaptable for use, because that's what these transformative engines do. They allow us to adapt content to be more useful in the workflows and the decisions we're making. So no. it's, it's like, you know, that's why I'm not so worried about the decline in fiction reading for entertainment, which is where the decline is. The decline isn't in uh, nonfiction reading and reading for uh, and, and, and using a video to say how to install a washer and a tap is far more effective than reading an instruction in a book. Yeah, well, I'm concerned that the general effect of the Internet uh has been to trade uh, efficiency or uh, scope for depth. Uh, That's right. You know, you have to put a little smiley when you're typing a text, when you're kidding, you know, because irony just doesn't get through. <laughs> it doesn't, no. it's filtered out. That So there's a depth that's lost. We gain tremendous access and quick communication and range of communication but we lose depth of communication that you would in a absolutely in a right letter so it's my son teaches to how to write an email my son teaches how to write an email to lawyers and engineers at mcgill university because they're so terrible at it I, and yeah, he's I'm, been doing it with foreign students and sitting there saying you got to provide context you got to do this you got to do that 
and he won an award as the best teacher I at the university because it. the students said it was the most important class they'd ever taken. Because well, if you're an yeah. engineer giving instructions on how to build a bridge, you can't just say use a number two bolt. Right, you have right. to say why it no, needs this to be was, stainless steel. I, I remember this from the 80s. There was a study done uh, at Stanford on the uh, funded by Lockheed on the skills coming out of Stanford or their engineers. They said their engineering chops are just entirely adequate. They're great. But what they lack is communication skills and working in teams, which are totally vital to us. So, you know, yeah. work on that stamp. So Stanford actually has, of course, they do all yeah. that. But it is just you know, engineers tend to think, you know, here it is. It 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 tells itself. It's self-evident that that it's fantastic. And so I don't have to tell you what it's about. You just you just know automatic. Well, that's not the way people are. And I think we also know that uh, we saw the same thing happen, and it's totally relevant to the AI internet space with MBAs having to reinstall their ethics curriculums. Uh, because uh, like, you know, the 2008 and various things that happened in the big uh, investment firms that were by and large very unethical and took the country down the toilet in 2008. And it was a more of an ethical thing than... Uh, than a regulation thing they just didn't like you know law is only the highest standard of ethics yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's yeah. ethics that yeah, right. sub, that are under that <laughs> is it ethical well i don't know but is it legal uh yeah and do it actually <laughs> exactly. care? I, I expected reed to weigh in a little more heavily on uh you know the 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 activities of 2008 by the banks being in this mm -hmm. i'm sorry we didn't want to get to the green banks but i i think what that's about is basically making money on green technology uh yeah. as opposed to funding fossil fuel developments but we'll we will try to get back to that so i, I put it in the comments i put it in the comments that the green strategies are essential but over the last few months the progress that's been made of taking the energy requirements of the nvidia chips alone is down like 90 percent so mm -hmm. The, like, you know, some of that stuff is very heartening. And then yeah. there's the double whammy of countries like Canada and the U.S. need to make battery recycling mandatory, not optional. Right, right, right. And but to Reed's point, there are people that oppose that. It doesn't seem to make sense, but it does yeah. the people that oppose it on the in their terms. In North uh, America, we're throwing out 250,000 cellular phones per day. Per day that's just I'm, I'm trying to avoid contributing to that, but i think i yeah. probably <laughs> okay i need to go thank it's great to see you both and great session and don our other fellow there as well so next time uh, actually Bye -bye. let's see two weeks we're going to have a great ai session so tune in thank all you. right thank you bye-bye bye -bye. You still there, Sean? You're muted.